Open University. Dearies, uh, welcome to Hanoi, where you find me in a, an art space called Six Space. Uh, last year, I took a break from recording my Pilcock album to um, see an exhibition in Tokyo called Sun Shower. It was uh, subtitled Contemporary Art for South, from Southeast Asia, 1980s to now. And it was the biggest exhibition uh, which has ever been staged of Southeast Asian art in Japan. And... Um, they chose this, this idea of a sun shower, which is, means rain falling from clear skies, um, as a sort of poetic metaphor for um, the ups and downs of a, a region which um, has had uh, huge uh, changes in the, the last 50, 60 years. And um, wars, dictatorships, modernization, democracy, uh, all the rest of it. So, out of the blue rainfall to them, was also a metaphor for the ambiguous nature of the bumps, I guess, the bumps and grinds of development. Um, I came here, being a, a bit of a pessimist, I came here having Googled um, bad experiences Hanoi, just to see what people's worst experiences here, here were. And um, people had been uh, terrified of the traffic, the fact that motorbikes were everywhere. People had been ripped off by taxi drivers and tour operators and people were drinking the water and breathing the air, and these were both polluted and making them sick. So that was the basic uh, scenario. And with this in mind, <laughs> I chose to um, walk 10 kilometers through the city with a suitcase. Um, I'd actually walked in Vientian to the airport, which was actually a, a very pleasant walk, just a couple of miles along the, the Mekong River. And I also discovered a really good Chinese market on the way. And then um, I took the airport bus in, um, having crossed the uh, Red River uh, coming in towards Hanoi, there was some sort of disturbance on the bridge, somebody had jumped off the bridge and all the police and people had stopped their motorbikes and were staring over into the water as if someone were, had just plopped into it. Um, I, I then looked at Google Maps which was telling me that the bus was going the wrong way from my hotel so I, I asked to get off in the middle of nowhere, and it looked fairly close on my Google Maps to my hotel, but it turned out to be 10 kilometers. So, in the evening, during the rush hour, I was negotiating these streets in which pavements notionally exist, but in fact you just can't use the pavements because they're either being populated by shopkeepers and their wares, or telegraph poles, or trees, or parked motorcycles. And you're forced out into the actual street with the the cars and the motorbikes, and basically with a with a suitcase, that's a kind of suicide mission. I kept trying to find little alleys um, to escape from the main road, but uh, the alleys all ended up in cul-de-sacs, and so that was kind of scary. Um, I eventually reached my hotel. I mean, I brought it on myself. It was a deliberate um, immersion, throwing into the deep end, jumping into the deep end, and. Um, Everything was going to be everything was going to be up from then on. I, th I think on one level, life in Vietnam is fairly toxic. It's it's a developing country. There is no regulation. You know of things like sidewalks, crossings, traffic lights. There are, there are a lot of soldiers about, a lot of policemen, and sort of people in uniforms about, but they don't seem to do anything to regulate. Um, so it's it's totally dereg, as um, Nathan Barley would would say, and uh, you kind of. On one level, you look at that and you think, this is awful. Okay, it's a city of 7.5 million. There are 5 million motorcycles within that. Um, and there are, um, on average, one death every hour in traffic. Uh, so that's about 24 deaths a, a day. And you can see why, because um, uh, crossing the road is just this, this hazardous mission where you have to walk out in front of the motorbikes on the understanding that they will part around you, which they do. And you realise after a while that it's not a, a malign kind of uh, traffic, it's quite a benign traffic where everyone's trying to get on, help, negotiate. Um, 
actually, you can't really negotiate. The principle, I realized after a couple of days, the principle is the same one that uh, bicycles have. And it's a, obviously a legacy from bicycle traffic, which is that um, you leave it to the bicycle to to work out a way around you as a pedestrian. That's what you do in Japan if you're on the pavement. You're a bicycle, come up behind people, and it's your business, not their business to look out for whether you're coming or not. It's your business to just wend your way around them. So once you realize that, this legacy of bicycle behavior, you realize it's more benign. But um, apparently the government here has uh, promised to ban motorbikes entirely by 2025. Um, people don't think that's going to happen. But if it does happen, it's going to be because they want to um, they want to gentrify the traffic and make more cars, uh, make more space for cars. Um, the tragic statistic is that in the early 90s, more than half of all journeys in Hanoi were taken, undertaken uh, on the bicycle. And now that's shrunk to about 3% of journeys. So the bicycle has really been banished. And this is a good example of how the development cycles are totally mismatched between the kind of advanced post-capitalist countries that I'm used to in Europe. You know, Norway, Copenhagen, Oslo, Copenhagen. These are kind of cities which um, are taking steps now to ban cars, to ban motorized traffic entirely and to get everybody back to riding bicycles. Here in Vietnam, they've only just kicked people off bicycles. And you'd think, wow, well, what you need here is communism. You need a way to actually force these people to do the right thing. And a government which would side with the people, the, the poorest people who can't afford motorbikes or cars. But, you know, <laughs> well, oops, there is communism here, but they don't actually um, support the bicycle. What they support is the car. They have a sort of nomenclatura, I guess, where they... Um, they are trying. All the people who are legislating are driving cars and want the roads to be for cars. The first thing you encounter at the airport when you log onto the free Wi-Fi is that you have to watch a commercial for a car. Welcome to a communist country. Here are the car commercials. You know, it's um, it's dereg. It's basically that that sort of the Vietnam that we know from news stories about Ken Clark. You know being heavily invested in uh, Vietnamese illegal tobacco factories which are flooding other countries with uh, cheap cigarettes because it's dereg, you know, basically it's um, uh, corruption. Um, the BBC News and all the BBC websites actually here are blocked, apparently because, I think because the BBC was recently reporting a corruption story about the Vietnamese government that one of the chief communist officials here had been um, uh, was was being scrutinized, had been arrested, and was being interrogated for corruption. So I think the um, while you might think that's a good sign that they are actually weeding out corruption, um, it does point the finger at there being corruption here. So perhaps even my reporting that, that will get this video blacklisted in, in Vietnam as well. All other websites, as far as I can see, are available. It's just the BBC. I like to fall asleep listening to um, BBC radio, but that's um, impossible here without a proxy server. But um, the city itself has been a revelation, and I, I actually, way back in the 80s, I, I bought a book about Vietnam, vaguely dreaming that this would be a great place to live. If you had to get out of the West and live somewhere cheaply, it would be somewhere like Vietnam. And uh, I think Berlin and Hanoi were probably the two places years ago that I was thinking of emigrating to if I had to become an expat. I mean, it didn't turn out that way, it turned out to be Japan. But actually, what I realized coming here is that all the kind of things that I respond to visually in Europe um, or in Japan, they are a kind of patina and vitality and a kind of, um, a kind of, you know, pattern clash, clothing, bright colors, plastic objects, the use of the pavement in kind of um, interesting ways. All these things are kind of, um, are much more intensely present here than they are in Japan. I mean, I, I like to go to the the poorest parts of Osaka, but they are incredibly rich compared to Vietnam. So, what really strikes you here is, first of all, the intensity. My first couple of days, I was just dazzled by the intensity, the colors. I mean, I I, I sort of measure my experience of cities in terms of event seconds, event slash seconds, events per second, not just the the number of events per second, but also the intensity of them and the quality of them, the photographability of them as well. So here, um, it's basically fatal if you don't pay attention 
to the traffic all the time. Whether you're on the pavement or not, whether you're crossing, you know, whether you have to look both ways on even one-way streets because there's going to be contra-flowing motorbikes everywhere. People beeping all the time, saying, "Pay attention," which in itself becomes a sort of blur. But you, you know, it is fatal. It will be fatal if you stop paying attention. So I just sort of stagger down the streets, half looking out for my life and half looking out for things to photograph patina to photograph and fantastic tiles and plastic, tiny Alice in Wonderland style stools in which people are sitting around in the sort of in thimblefuls of space, you know, the kind of space that would just be one chair in a western pavement restaurant would be a whole cafe or a whole restaurant here in Vietnam. But um, also um, just just really aghast at how, um, how high quality the um, event seconds are here. And um, and also how me it is. I mean, in a sense, you're you're used to the kind of things that uh, you know. You have miniaturized Vietnams in the form of, let's say, in London in the late '90s, the art scene revolved around certain Vietnamese restaurants on the Kingsland Road, um, just off Hoxton Square. You'd have the Viet Hoa, and all the artists would be in there, and it would be a Vietnamese ambience. You know, or in New York or wherever you'd sort of gravitate to Vietnamese restaurants or. But here it's, um, the whole city is like that, but it also feels very Parisian. I keep thinking I'm in certain parts of Paris, you know, the more um, vital parts of Paris. And um, I guess it also, um, yeah, it feels like other Asian cities I've been to, but, but just much more, in, it's much more intensely Asian than, uh, than anything I've, I've experienced so far. So in a way it's my, my ideal city and I'm just very happy to, to be here. So I think I kind of, pretty early on, I bracketed my outrage at the fact that the pavement is not, for instance, available for walking in the way it would be in a European city. There aren't the EU regulations being enforced. There isn't the kind of um, clinical um, cleanliness you'd have in Japan, that Swiss-style cleanliness they have. And But what you get is a kind of Nietzschean sense of danger, a sense of almost a Stockholm syndrome, where you, you're grateful, having crossed the road and risked your life, grateful that the motorcycles that could have killed you didn't. You're grateful to your captors, grateful to the people who threaten you, um, that they didn't kill you. So, in fact, there's this kind of, you know, Nietzsche said, live dangerously. And, and people like um, Arakawa and Ginz, the architects, um, developed that into a kind of dangerous architecture where everything is <clears throat> hazardous and this is meant to enhance life. And, in fact, it does. You know, there is this sense that... Uh, the intensity and the, the danger and the fact that you have to pay attention to things in a certain way here actually makes it makes for a great vitality and a great pleasure and you realize that people are people are having fun i think i i also i kind of gave into the motorbike culture i mean i on paper i hate motorbikes and i hate cars but i suddenly on the second day here i said to myself listen look at these helmets aren't these fantastic these colorful cheap plastic helmets that are sold at every you know, there'll be something like a little hardware store or a newsagent store, but the real thing that they're selling, uh, the main product they're selling is crash helmets for motorbikes. And it's, uh, these come in great colours, and I suddenly thought, the Palio of Siena, you know, this, <laughs> this is the way I think. I think it looks like those horse riders from the medieval Italian cities. I mean, this uh, the, the ambience of Hanoi also reminds me of Sicily, um, Naples, you know, these South Italian cities where everybody's on their, their scooters, of course, or would have been in the 50s, perhaps like more like a 1950s version of Italy. There are also these amazing warrens. They're old, the old quarter, the sort of um, touristy old quarter, you know, in a sense, many cities would have that and that would be it. They wouldn't really have any other local colour. They'd just be freeways, flyovers and skyscrapers and all the other boring stuff, the administrative stuff. But, you know, that is actually the very least of Hanoi's charms. Uh, if you go to quieter neighbourhoods like Dong Da, you will find um, amazing warrens of back streets. And those are, you know, you, you might think you can escape from the main roads and from the traffic there, but of course, even in the tiniest little narrow uh, labyrinthine back alleys, where, where inside and outside blur, and you're never quite sure whether you're in someone's house or in a courtyard or just in an alleyway with, a, with no street name, there will be motorbikes going past, and um, you just have to press yourself against the wall or or ignore them and hope that they steer around you. And um, So, yeah, I've really been fascinated just wandering through or seeing things like the barber's seats. You know, the, in the West, we would 
you'd have to go to barbering academy or something or become a beautician and get a degree and then you'd have to get a, a loan to set up your own barber shop and here in in hanoi all you need is a pair of scissors a cloth you know to cover the customer's neck a chair and a mirror and you can set up anywhere you just affix your mirror to a bit of blank wall and customers will come and they'll have their hair cut and there are many places all over town where things like that are happening i just passed earlier this afternoon people smashing up computers on the pavement or or i passed a live pig in a bell-shaped cage i keep passing these things which absolutely stagger me um you know chickens running around um all sorts of livestock in the middle of the city children i you think these children won't they won't live you know um another six months because how could they they'll become one of these accident statistics one of these 24 people a day but of course there are also little old ladies and uh, people who've lived their whole lives in this kind of apparently very dangerous situation i've taken to actually crossing the road with the old ladies because it seems much safer that uh, you know if they if they've been doing it that long then i can do it too So th things I disapprove of on paper, like uh, motorbikes and uh, sports, have actually proved to to supply this city with some of its greatest vitality. We had an under-23 football team victory on uh, Tuesday against Qatar, uh, Vietnam against Qatar. Uh, Qatar were slated to win. Vietnam actually won on penalties, and there was such a joyous eruption through the whole city uh, when this happened. Um, it was just amazing, fireworks being let off, people um, waving flags as they, they raced through the city streets on their motorbikes. And, uh, you know, it was everybody was caught up in it. It was very difficult to resist the joy. Um, this will absolutely climax on Saturday if that, uh, because it's the final on Saturday. This is the first time a Vietnamese team has gone through to the final and um, Vietnam are matched against Uzbekistan. So if they win that, it's just going to be chaos in the city. It's going to be absolute chaos. But um, it's, uh, you know, I've just had to bracket my, um, some of my uh, disapproving, uh, my judgmental side, and actually realize that it, the city actually supplies so much of what I do enjoy and what I can learn from as well. Um, that it's um, it's worth it. I've been looking into the sort of creative side, the fine art side, uh, which uh, Sun Shower investigated, and um, it's kind of you know I haven't really seen any signs of particularly exciting activity. Um, there's a there was a place called Zone Nine, um, which for about six months in 2015 was the trendy venue for art events and exhibitions in Hanoi. Um, there was a fire, somebody died, and the government closed it down. And then there was a, there's a skyscraper called Hanoi Creative City, which has been refurbished. And some of the people who were involved in um, Zone 9, like the Nasan Collective, uh, were rehoused in this um, tower block. But that's lost momentum very much in the last uh, year or so. And <clears throat> even a lot of the cafes and things which were in their trendy sort of creative ambience cafes have closed down already. Nasan is still in there, but they're you know, probably going to move somewhere else. And uh, there's a sad little courtyard of um, containers which uh, all claim to be creative businesses or startups or, you know, co-working spaces, that kind of thing. The kind of um, gentrifying efforts which uh, governments tend to <clears throat> or, you know, real estate people tend to endorse as creativity. There are little um, places like Six Space here, or like um, the, um, there's a place called Manzi, some little cafes which have art spaces upstairs, um, another cafe called um, uh, Tranquil. Um, so there's various things, you know, things which were featured in the, um, there's a very good book from the Sun Shower exhibition which <clears throat> shows all the research they did. There are also some great markets. I mean, there's some fantastic flea markets and um, clothes and food markets. Um, but I haven't really seen, I haven't seen very good second-hand clothes. People are possibly too poor to, to be interested in wearing second-hand clothes in the way that Japanese or Europeans wear them, um, in that kind of interested curatorial way where you go back to the past and try to find interesting old clothes. I have invested in a, a face mask because they have some very nice patterned face masks here, um, which uh, 
again sort of reconciled me a little bit to the unbreathable air. Every day there's kind of fog <clears throat> in the morning and uh, it takes the sun about, you know, four hours to burn through that fog. It's essentially smog, pollution smog. Uh, it's become, like other cities like Jakarta, you know, the traffic is simply um, out of control and the pollution is out of control. And there is no, there is this uh, ASEAN uh, organization which is now 50 years old, but uh, there is no EU to regulate these things, or <clears throat> if, if ASEAN is regulating pollution levels and things like that, we're certainly not seeing results of it yet. Um, they have a, a plan for a metro in um, Hanoi, which is uh, keeps getting delayed. Um, there are railway lines which go through the centre of the city, but they, there are no trains whatsoever on them. Even the main tracks leading up to the main railway station seem to have no trains on them. It's very bizarre. Whenever you see a railway line, what you actually have is simply a, a kind of uh, a nice way to, to get through the city without having to deal with the traffic. Uh, although there is the odd motorbike even kind of bumping along beside the railway tracks. But they are actually very charming little sort of streets without traffic. And they do give you an indication of just how paradisal really this city must have been when there were just bicycles, when you could walk around in a fairly stress-free way uh, before the motorbikes really took over. I don't know what I'll find when I go to Yangon, which is, uh, notionally anyway, has banned motorbikes from the city centre entirely. Um, that may not be the case, and that might just be propaganda. Um, and Yangon is my next destination, but uh, I think Hanoi is going to take a lot of beating. I think this is a pretty amazing city. I'm having a whale of time. I, I, I can't really take much intensity beyond about three or four hours a day, I tend to retreat to my uh, the controlled environment of my hotel room, which is actually a fairly good hotel, um, uh, uh, in, in contrast to the slightly cockroach-infested place I had in uh, Vientiane. It's, uh, it's got all mod cons, it's very peaceful, and um, I like the fact that there's a clean, uh, well-lighted space that I can retreat to, even if the power has failed a couple of times, um, people have got trapped in the elevator and uh, <laughs> that sort of thing. So it's not, it's not paradise, but um, it is a place I can withdraw and think about the amazing stuff I've been seeing. Open University. <laughs>